Chapter 13 The Blind Beggar Who Rode He seemed a beggar such as lags, looking for crusts and ale. Chesterton The cold grey dawn was stealing over the river as we stood in the deserted bar of the Temple of Dreams. Gordon was questioning the two men who had remained on guard outside the building while their unfortunate companions went in to explore the tunnel. As soon as we heard the whistle, sir, Leary and Merkin rushed the bar and broke into the opium room while we waited here at the bar door, according to orders. Right away, several ragged dopers came tumbling out and we grabbed them, but no one else came out and we heard nothing from Leary and Merkin, so we just waited until you came, sir. You saw nothing of the giant negro or the Chinaman, Yan Shatu. No, sir. After a while, the patrolman arrived and we threw a cordon around the house, but no one was seen. Gordon shrugged his shoulders. A few cursory questions had satisfied him that the captives were harmless addicts and he had them released. You are sure no one else came out? Yes, sir. No, wait a moment. A wretched old blind beggar did come out all rags and dirt, and with a ragged girl leading him. We stopped him, but didn't hold him. A wretch like that couldn't be harmful. No, Gordon jerked out. Which way did he go? The girl led him down the street to the next block, and then an automobile stopped, and they got in and drove off, sir. Gordon glared at him. The stupidity of the London detective has rightfully become an international jest, he said acidly. No doubt it never occurred to you as being strange that a limehouse beggar should ride about in his own automobile. Then, impatiently waving aside the man who sought to speak further, he turned to me, and I saw the lines of weariness beneath his eyes. Mr. Costigan, if you will come to my apartment, we may be able to clear up some new things. Chapter 14 The Black Empire Oh, the new spears dipped in lifeblood as the woman shrieked in vain. Oh, the days before the English. When will those days come again? Monday Gordon struck a match and absently allowed it to flicker and go out in his hand. His Turkish cigarette hung unlighted between his fingers. This is the most logical conclusion to be reached, he was saying. The weak link in our chain was lack of men, but curse it, one cannot round up an army at two o'clock in the morning, even with the aid of Scotland Yard. I went on to Limehouse, leading orders for a number of patrolmen to follow me as quickly as they could be got together, and to throw a cordon about the house. They arrived too late to prevent the master's servants slipping out of the side doors and windows, no doubt as they could easily do with only Finnegan and Hansen on guard at the front of the building. However, they arrived in time to prevent the master himself from slipping out that way. No doubt he lingered to effect his disguise and was caught in that manner. He owes his escape to his craft and boldness and to the carelessness of Finnegan and Hansen, the girl who accompanied him. She was Zuleika, without doubt, I answered listlessly, wondering anew what shackles bound her to the Egyptian sorcerer. You owe your life to her, Gordon rapped, lighting another match. We were standing in the shadows in front of the warehouse, waiting for the hour to strike, and of course ignorant as to what was going on in the house, when a girl appeared at one of the barred windows and begged us for God's sake to do something, that a man was being murdered, so we broke in at once. However, she was not to be seen when we entered. She returned to the room, no doubt, I muttered, and was forced to accompany the master. God grant he knows nothing of her trickery. I do not know, said Gordon, dropping the charred match stem. Whether she guessed at our true identity, 
or whether she just made the appeal in desperation. However, the main point is this. Evidence points to the fact that, on hearing the whistle, Leary and Merkin invaded Yan Chateau's from the front at the same instant my three men and I made our attack on the warehouse front. As it took us some seconds to batter down the door, it is logical to suppose that they found the secret door and entered the tunnel before we effected an entrance into the warehouse. The master, knowing our plans beforehand and being aware that an invasion would be made through the tunnel and having long ago made preparations for such an exigency, an involuntary shudder shook me. The master worked the lever that opened the chest. The screams you heard as you lay upon the altar were the death shrieks of Leary and Merkin. Then, leaving the Chinaman behind to finish you, the master and the rest descended into the tunnel, incredibly, as it seems, and threading their way, unharmed among the serpents, entered Yan Chateau's house and escaped therefrom, as I have said. That seems impossible. Why should not the snakes turn on them? Gordon finally ignited his cigarette and puffed a few seconds before replying. The reptiles might have been giving their full and hideous attention to the dying men, or else I have on previous occasions been confronted with indisputable proof of the master's dominance over beasts and reptiles of even the lowest or most dangerous orders. How he and his slaves passed unhurt among those scaly fiends must remain at present one of the many unsolved mysteries pertaining to that strange man. I stirred restlessly in my chair. This brought up a point for the purpose of clearing up which I had come to Gordon's neat but bizarre apartments. You have not yet told me, I said abruptly, who this man is and what is his mission. As to who he is, I can only say that he is known as you name him the Master. I have never seen him unmasked, nor do I know his real name nor his nationality. I can enlighten you to an extent there, I broke in. I have seen him unmasked and have heard the name his slaves call him. Gordon's eyes blazed and he leaned forward. His name, I continued, is Cthulhu's and he claims to be an Egyptian. Cthulhu's, Gordon repeated. You say he claims to be an Egyptian. Have you any reason for doubting his claim of that nationality? He may be of Egypt, I answered slowly, but he is different, somehow, from any human I ever saw or hoped to see. Great age might account for some of his peculiarities, but there are certain lineal differences that my anthropological studies tell me have been present since birth, features that would be abnormal to any other man, but which are perfectly normal in Cthulhu's. That sounds paradoxical, I admit, but to appreciate fully the horrid inhumaneness of the man, you would have to see him yourself. Gordon sat at attention while I swiftly sketched the appearance of the Egyptian as I remembered him, and that appearance was indelibly etched on my brain forever. As I finished, he nodded. As I have said, I never saw Cthulhu's, except when disguised as a beggar, a leper or some such thing, when he was fairly swathed in rags. Still, I too have been impressed with a strange difference about him, something that is not present in other men. Gordon tapped his knee with his fingers, a habit of his when deeply engrossed by a problem of some sort. You have asked as to the mission of this man, he said slowly. I will tell you all I know. My position with the British government is a unique and peculiar one. I hold what might be called a roving commission, an office created solely for the purpose of suiting my special needs. As a Secret Service official during the war, I convinced the powers of a need of such office and of my ability to fill it. Somewhat over seventeen months ago, I was sent to South Africa to investigate the unrest which has been growing among the natives of the interior 
ever since the World War, and which of late assumed alarming proportions. There, I first got on the track of this man, Cthulhu's. I found, in roundabout ways, that Africa was a seething cauldron of rebellion from Morocco to Cape Town. The old, old vow had been made again. The Negroes and the Mohammedans banded together should drive the white man into the sea. This pact has been made before, but always hitherto broken. Now, however, I sensed a giant intellect and a monstrous genius behind the veil, a genius powerful enough to accomplish this union and hold it together. Working entirely on hints and vague whispered clues, I followed the trail up through Central Africa and into Egypt. There, at last, I came upon definite evidence that such a man existed. The whispers hinted of a living dead man, a skull-faced man. I learned that this man was the high priest of the mysterious Scorpion Society of Northern Africa. He was spoken of variously as Skullface, the Master, and the Scorpion. Following a trail of bribed officials and filched state secrets, I at last trailed him to Alexandria, where I had my first sight of him in a dive in the native quarter, disguised as a leper. I heard him distinctly addressed as Mighty Scorpion by the natives, but he escaped me. All trace vanished then. The trail ran out entirely until rumours of strange happenings in London reached me, and I came back to England to investigate an apparent leak in the war office. As I thought, the scorpion had preceded me. This man, whose education and craft transcend anything I have ever met with, is simply the leader and instigator of a worldwide movement such as the world has never before seen. He plots, in a word, the overthrow of the white races. His ultimate aim is a black empire, with himself as emperor of the world. And to that end, he has banded together in one monstrous conspiracy, the black, the brown, and the yellow. I understand now what Yusuf Ali meant when he said, The days of the empire... I muttered. Exactly, Gordon rapped with suppressed excitement. Cthulhu's power is limited and unguessed. Like an octopus, his tentacles stretch to the high places of civilization and the far corners of the world, and his main weapon is dope. He has flooded Europe, and no doubt America, with opium and hashish, and in spite of all effort, it has been impossible to discover the break in the barriers through which the hellish stuff is coming. With this, he ensnares and enslaves men and women. You have told me of the aristocratic men and women you saw coming to Yan Chateau's dive. Without doubt, they were dope addicts. For, as I said, the habit lurks in high places. Holders of governmental positions, no doubt, coming to trade the stuff they craved and giving in return state secrets, inside information, and promise of protection for the master's crimes. Oh, he does not work haphazardly. Even before the black flood breaks, he will be prepared. If he has his way, the governments of white races will be honeycombs of corruption. The strongest men of the white races will be dead. The white men's secrets of war will be his. When it comes, I look for a simultaneous uprising against white supremacy of all the coloured races, races who, in the last war, learned the white man's way of battle, and who, led by such a man as Cthulhu, and armed with white men's finest weapons, will be almost invincible. A steady stream of rifles and ammunition has been pouring into East Africa, and it was not until I discovered the source that it was stopped. I found that a staid and reliable Scotch firm was smuggling these arms among the natives, and I found more. The manager of this firm was an opium slave. That was enough. I saw Cthulhu's hand in the matter. The manager was arrested 
and committed suicide in his cell. That is only one of the many situations with which I am called upon to deal. Again, the case of Major Phelan Morley. He, like myself, held a very flexible commission and has been sent to the Transvaal to work upon the same case. He sent to London a number of secret papers for safekeeping. They arrived some weeks ago and were put in a bank vault. The letter accompanying them gave explicit instructions that they were to be delivered to no one but the Major himself when he called for them in person or, in the event of his death, to myself. As soon as I learned that he had sailed from Africa, I sent trusted men to Bordeaux, where he intended to make the first landing in Europe. They did not succeed in saving the Major's life, but they certified his death, for they found his body in a deserted ship whose hulk was stranded on the beach. Efforts were made to keep the affair a secret, but somehow it leaked into the papers with the result. I begin to understand why I was to impersonate the unfortunate major. I interrupted. Exactly. A false beard furnished you, and your black hair dyed blonde. You would have presented yourself at the bank, received the papers from the banker who knew Major Morley just intimately enough to be deceived by your appearance, and the papers would have then fallen into the hands of the master. I can only guess at the contents of those papers, for events have been taking place too swiftly for me to call for and obtain them, but they must deal with subjects closely connected with the activities of Cthulhus. How he learned of them, and of the provisions of the letter accompanying them, I have no idea. But, as I said, London is honeycombed with his spies. In my search for clues, I often frequented Limehouse, disguised as you first saw me. I went often to the Temple of Dreams, and even once managed to enter the back room, for I suspected some sort of rendezvous in the rear of the building. The absence of any exit baffled me, and I had no time to search for secret doors before I was ejected by the giant black man Hasim, who had no suspicion of my true identity. I noticed that very often the leper entered or left Yan Chateaus, and finally it was borne on me that past a shadow of doubt this supposed leper was the scorpion himself. That night you discovered me on the couch in the opium room. I had come there with no especial plan in mind. Seeing Cthulhus leaving, I determined to rise and follow him, but you spoiled that. He fingered his chin and laughed grimly. I was an amateur boxing champion in Oxford, said he, but Tom Cribb himself could not have withstood that blow or have dealt it. I regret it as I regret few things. No need to apologize. You saved my life immediately afterward. I was stunned, but not too much to know that the brown devil Yusuf Ali was burning to cut my heart. How did you come to be at Sir Haldred Frenton's estate? And how is it that you did not raid Yan Chateau's dive? I did not have the place raided, because I knew, somehow, Cthulhus would be warned, and our efforts would come to naught. I was at Sir Haldred's that night, because I have contrived to spend at least part of each night with him since he returned from the Congo. I anticipated an attempt upon his life, when I learned from his own lips that he was preparing from the studies he made on this trip, a treatise on the secret native societies of West Africa. He hinted that the disclosures he intended to make therein might prove sensational, to say the least. Since it is to Cthulhu's advantage to destroy such men as might be able to arouse the Western world to its danger, I knew that Sir Haldred was a marked man. Indeed, Two distinct attempts were made upon his life on his journey to the coast from the African interior. So I put two trusted men on guard, and they are at their post even now. Roaming about the darkened house, I heard the noise of your entry, and, warning my men, I stole down to intercept you. At the time of our conversation, Sir Haldred was sitting in his unlighted study, 
a Scotland Yard man, with drawn pistol on each side of him. Their vigilance no doubt accounts for Yusuf Ali's failure to attempt what you were sent to do. Something in your manner convinced me in spite of yourself, he meditated. I will admit I had some bad moments of doubt as I waited in the darkness that precedes dawn, outside the warehouse. Gordon rose suddenly, and going to a strong box which stood in the corner of the room, drew thence a thick envelope. Although Cthulhus has checkmated me at almost every move, he said, I have not been entirely idle. Noting the frequenters of Yan Chateaus, I have compiled a partial list of the Egyptians' right-hand men and their records. What you have told me has enabled me to complete that list. As we know, his henchmen are scattered all over the world, and there are possibly hundreds of them here in London. However, this is a list of those I believe to be in his closest council. Now, with him in England, he told you himself that few, even of his followers, ever saw him unmasked. We bent together over the list, which contained the following names. Yan Shatu, Hong Kong Chinese, suspected opium smuggler, keeper of Temple of Dreams, resident of Limehouse seven years. Hassim, ex-Senegalese chief, wanted in French Congo for murder. Santiago, Negro, fled from Haiti under suspicion of voodoo worship atrocities. Ya Khan, Afridi, record unknown. Yusuf Ali, Moore, slave dealer in Morocco, suspected of being a German spy in the World War, an instigator of the Fellaheen Rebellion on the Upper Nile. Ganra Singh, Lahore, India, Sikh, smuggler of arms into Afghanistan, took an active part in the Lahore and Delhi riots. Suspected of murder on two occasions, a dangerous man. Stephen Costigan, American, resident in England since the war, hashish addict, man of remarkable strength. Li Kung, northern China, opium smuggler. Lines were drawn significantly through three names. Mine, Li Kung's, and Yusuf Ali's. Nothing was written next to mine, but following Li Kung's name was scrawled briefly in Gordon's rambling characters, shot by John Gordon during the raid on Yan Chateaus, and following the name of Yusuf Ali, killed by Stephen Costigan during the Yan Chateau raid. I laughed mirthlessly. Black Empire or not, Yusuf Ali would never hold Zuleika in his arms, for he had never risen from where I had felt him. I know not, said Gordon somberly, as he folded the list and replaced it in the envelope. What power Cthulhus has that draws together black men and yellow men to serve him, that unites the old world foes? Hindu, Muslim, and pagan are among his followers, and back in the mists of the east, where mysteries and gigantic forces are at work, this uniting is culminating on a monstrous scale. He glanced at his watch. It is nearly ten. Make yourself at home here, Mr. Costigan, while I visit Scotland Yard and see if any clue has been found as to Cthulhu's new quarters. I believe that the webs are closing on him, and with your aid, I promise that we will have the gang located within a week at most. Chapter 15 the Mark of the Tulwar. The fed wolf curls by his drowsy mate in a tight trod earth, but the lean wolves wait. Monday. I sat in John Gordon's apartments and laughed mirthlessly. In spite of the elixir's stimulus, the strain of the previous night, with its loss of sleep, and its heart-rending actions was telling on me. My mind was a chaotic whirl, wherein the faces of Gordon, Cthulhu, and Zuleika 
shifted with numbing swiftness. All the mass of information Gordon had given to me seemed jumbled and incoherent. Through this state of being, one fact stood out boldly. I must find the latest hiding place of the Egyptian and get Zuleika out of his hands, if indeed she still lived. A week, Gordon had said. I laughed again. A week and I would be beyond aiding any more. I had found the proper amount of elixir to use, knew the minimum amount my system required, and knew that I could make the flask last me for four days at most. Four days. Four days in which to comb the rat holes of Limehouse and Chinatown. Four days in which to ferret out, somewhere in the mazes of East End, the lair of Cthulhu's. I burned with impatience to begin, but nature rebelled, and staggering to a couch, I fell upon it and was asleep instantly. Then, someone was shaking me. Wake up, Mr. Costigan. I sat up, blinking. Gordon stood over me, his face haggard. There's devil's work done, Costigan. The scorpion has struck again. I sprang up, still half asleep and only partly realizing what he was saying. He helped me into my coat, thrust my hat at me, and then his firm grip on my arm was propelling me out of his door and down the stairs. The street lights were blazing. I had slept an incredible time. A logical victim, I was aware that my companion was saying. He should have notified me the instant of his arrival. I don't understand, I began dazedly. We were at the curb now, and Gordon hailed a taxi, giving the address of a small and unassuming hotel in a staid and prim section of the city. The Baron Rockoff, he rapped as we whirled along at reckless speed. A Russian freelance, connected with the war office. He returned from Mongolia yesterday and apparently went into hiding. Undoubtedly, he had learned something vital in regard to the slow waking of the East. He had not yet communicated with us, and I had no idea that he was in England until just now. And you learned? The Baron was found in his room, his dead body mutilated in a frightful manner. The respectable and conventional hotel, which the doomed Baron had chosen for his hiding place, was in a state of mild uproar, suppressed by the police. The management had attempted to keep the matter quiet, but somehow the guests had learned of the atrocity and many were leaving in haste, or preparing to, as the police were holding all for investigation. The Baron's room, which was on the top floor, was in a state to defy description. Not even in the Great War have I seen a more complete shambles. Nothing had been touched. All remained just as the chambermaid had found it a half hour since. Tables and chairs lay shattered on the floor, and the furniture, floor and walls were splattered with blood. The Baron, a tall, muscular man in life, lay in the middle of the room, a fearful spectacle. His skull had been cleft to the brows. A deep gash under his left armpit had shorn through his ribs, and his left arm hung by a shred of flesh. The cold, bearded face was set in a look of indescribable horror. Some heavy, curved weapon must have been used, said Gordon. Something like a sabre, wielded with terrific force. See where a chance blow sank inches deep into the windowsill, and again the thick back of this heavy chair has been split like a shingle, a sabre, surely. A tulwar, I muttered somberly. Do you not recognize the handiwork of the Central Asian butcher? Yar Khan has been here. The Afghan! He came across the roofs, of course, and descended to the window ledge by means of a knotted rope made fast to something on the edge of the roof. About one thirty, the maid, passing through the corridor, heard a terrific commotion in the baron's room, smashing of chairs and a sudden short shriek which died abruptly in a ghastly gurgle and then ceased 
to the sound of heavy blows, curiously muffled, such as a sword might make when driven deep into human flesh. Then all noises stopped suddenly. She called the manager, and they tried the door, and finding it locked and receiving no answer to their shouts, opened it with the desk key. Only the corpse was there, but the window was open. This is strangely unlike Cthulhu's usual procedure. It lacks subtlety. Often his victims have appeared to have died from natural causes. I scarcely understand. I see little difference in the outcome, I answered. There is nothing that can be done to apprehend the murderer as it is. True, Gordon scowled. We know who did it, but there is no proof, not even a fingerprint. Even if we knew where the Afghan is hiding and arrested him, we could prove nothing. There would be a score of men to swear alibis for him. The Baron returned only yesterday. Cthulhu probably did not know of his arrival until tonight. He knew that on the morrow Rokoff would make known his presence to me, and in part what he had learned in northern Asia. The Egyptian knew he must strike quickly, and lacking time to prepare a safer and more elaborate form of murder, he sent the Afridi with his tulwar. There is nothing we can do, at least not until we discover the scorpion's hiding place, what the baron had learned in Mongolia, we shall never know, but that it dealt with the plans and aspirations of Cthulhu, we may be sure. We went down the stairs again and out into the street, accompanied by one of the Scotland Yard men, Hanson. Gordon suggested that we walk back to his apartment, and I greeted the opportunity to let the cool night air blow some of the cobwebs out of my mazed brain. As we walked along the deserted streets, Gordon suddenly cursed savagely. This is a veritable labyrinth we are following, leading nowhere. Here, in the very heart of civilization's metropolis, the direct enemy of that civilization commits crimes of the most outrageous nature and goes free. We are children, wandering in the night, struggling with an unseen evil, dealing with an incarnate devil, of whose true identity we know nothing and whose true ambitions we can only guess. Never have we managed to arrest one of the Egyptians' direct henchmen, and the few dupes and tools of his we have apprehended have died mysteriously before they could tell us anything. Again I repeat, what strange power has Cthulhu that dominates these men of different creeds and races? The men in London with him are, of course, mostly renegades, slaves of dope, but his tentacles stretch all over the East. Some dominance is his, the power that sent the Chinaman, Li Kung, back to kill you in the face of certain death, that sent Ya Khan, the Muslim, over the roofs of London to do murder, that holds Zuleika the Circassian in unseen bonds of slavery. Of course we know, he continued after a brooding silence, that the East has secret societies which are behind and above all considerations of creeds. There are cults in Africa and the Orient, whose origin dates back to Ophir and the fall of Atlantis. This man must be a power in some or possibly all of these societies. Why, outside the Jews, I know of no Oriental race which is so cordially despised by all the other Eastern races as the Egyptians. Yet here we have a man, an Egyptian by his own word, controlling the lives and destinies of Orthodox Muslims, Hindus, Shintos, and devil worshippers. It's unnatural. Have you ever, he turned to me abruptly, heard the ocean mentioned in connection with Cthulhu? Never. There is a widespread superstition in northern Africa based on a very ancient legend that the great leader of the coloured races would come out of the sea, and I heard once a Berber speak of the scorpion as the son of the ocean. That is a term of respect among that tribe, is it not? 
Yes, still, I wonder sometimes. Chapter 16 The Mummy Who Laughed Laughing as littered skulls that lie after long battles turn to the sky, an everlasting laugh. Chesterton A shop opened this late, Gordon remarked suddenly. A fog had descended on London, and along the quiet street we were traversing, the lights glimmered with the peculiar reddish haze characteristic of such atmospheric conditions. Our footfalls echoed drearily. Even in the heart of a great city, there are always sections which seem overlooked and forgotten. Such a street was this. Not even a policeman was in sight. The shop which had attracted Gordon's attention was just in front of us, on the same side of the street. There was no sign over the door, merely some sort of emblem, something like a dragon. Light flowed from the open doorway and the small show windows on each side. As it was neither a cafe nor the entrance to a hotel, we found ourselves idly speculating over its reason for being open. Ordinarily, I suppose, neither of us would have given the matter a thought, but our nerves were so keyed up that we found ourselves instinctively suspicious of anything out of the ordinary. Then, Something occurred which was distinctly out of the ordinary. A very tall, very thin man, considerably stooped, suddenly loomed up out of the fog in front of us and beyond the shop. I had only a glance of him, an impression of incredible gauntness, of worn, wrinkled garments, a high silk hat drawn close over the brows, a face entirely hidden by a muffler, then he turned aside and entered the shop. A cold wind whispered down the street, twisting the fog into wispy ghosts, but the coldness that came upon me transcended the winds. Gordon! I exclaimed in a fierce, low voice. My senses are no longer reliable, or else Cthulhu's himself has just gone into that house. Gordon's eyes blazed. We were now close to the shop, and lengthening his strides into a run, he hurled himself into the door, the detective and I close upon his heels. A weird assortment of merchandise met our eyes. Antique weapons covered the walls, and the floor was piled high with curious things. Maori idols shouldered Chinese josses, and suits of medieval armour bulked darkly against stacks of rare oriental rugs, and Latin-made shawls. The place was an antique shop. Of the figure who had aroused our interest, we saw nothing. An old man clad bizarrely in red fez, brocaded jacket, and Turkish slippers came from the back of the shop. He was a Levantine of some sort. You wish something, sirs? You keep open rather late, Gordon said abruptly, his eyes travelling swiftly over the shop, for some secret hiding place that might conceal the object of our search. Yes, sir, my customers number many eccentric professors, and students who keep very irregular hours. Often the night boats unload special pieces for me, and very often I have customers later than this. I remain open all night, sir. We are merely looking around, Gordon returned and in an instant aside to Hansen, go to the back and stop anyone who tries to leave that way. Hansen nodded and strolled casually to the rear of the shop. The back door was clearly visible to our view, through a vista of antique furniture and tarnished hangings strung up for exhibition. We had followed the scorpion, if he it was, so closely that I did not believe he would have had time to traverse the full length of the shop and make his exit without our having seen him as we came in, for our eyes had been on the rear door ever since we had entered. Gordon and I browsed around casually among the curios, 
handling and discussing some of them, but I have no idea as to their nature. The Levantine had seated himself cross-legged on a Moorish mat close to the centre of the shop, and apparently took only a polite interest in our explorations. After a time, Gordon whispered to me, There is no advantage in keeping up this pretense. We have looked everywhere. The scorpion might be hiding in the ordinary manner. I will make known my identity and authority, and we will search the entire building openly. Even as he spoke, a truck drew up outside the door, and two burly negroes entered. The Levantine seemed to have expected them, for he merely waved them toward the back of the shop, and they responded with a grunt of understanding. Gordon and I watched them closely as they made their way to a large mummy case which stood upright against the wall, not far from the back. They lowered this to a level position and then started for the door, carrying it carefully between them. Halt! Gordon stepped forward raising his hand authoritatively. I represent Scotland Yard, he said swiftly, and have sanctioned for anything I choose to do. Set that mummy down. Nothing leaves this shop until we have thoroughly searched it. The Negroes obeyed without a word, and my friend turned to the Levantine, who, apparently not perturbed or even interested, sat smoking a Turkish water pipe. Who was that tall man who entered just before we did, and where did he go? No one entered before you, sir, or if anyone did, I was at the back of the shop and did not see him. You are certainly at liberty to search my shop, sir. And search we did, with the combined craft of a secret service expert and a denizen of the underworld, while Hansen stood stolidly at his post, the two negroes standing over the carved mummy case watched us impassively, and the Levantine, sitting like a sphinx on his mat, puffing a fog of smoke into the air. The whole thing had a distinct effect of unreality. At last, baffled, we returned to the mummy case, which was certainly long enough to conceal even a man of Cthulhu's height. The thing did not appear to be sealed, as is the usual custom, and Gordon opened it without difficulty. A formless shape, swathed in mouldering wrappings, met our eyes. Gordon parted some of the wrappings and revealed an inch or so of withered, brownish, leathery arm. He shuddered involuntarily as he touched it, as a man will do at the touch of a reptile or some inhumanly cold thing. Taking a small metal idol from a stand nearby, He rapped on the shrunken breast and the arm. Each gave out a solid thumping, like some sort of wood. Gordon shrugged his shoulders. Dead for two thousand years anyway, and I don't suppose I should risk destroying a valuable mummy simply to prove what we know to be true. He closed the case again. The mummy may have crumbled some, even from this much exposure, but perhaps it did not. This last was addressed to the Levantine, who replied merely by a courteous gesture of his hand, and the Negroes once more lifted the case and carried it to the truck, where they loaded it on, and a moment later, mummy, truck, and Negroes had vanished in the fog. Gordon still nosed about the shop, but I stood stock still in the center of the floor. To my chaotic and dope-ridden brain, I attribute it, but the sensation had been mine, that through the wrappings of the mummy's face great eyes had burned into mine, eyes like pools of yellow fire, that seared my soul and froze me where I stood. And as the case had been carried through the door, I knew that the lifeless thing in it, dead, God only knows how many centuries, was laughing, hideously and silently. Chapter 17. The Dead Man from the Sea The blind gods roar and rave and dream of all cities under the sea. 
Chesterton. Gordon puffed savagely at his Turkish cigarette, staring abstractly and unseeingly at Hansen, who sat opposite him. We must chalk up another failure against ourselves. That Levantine, Kamenos, is evidently a creature of the Egyptians, and the walls and floors of his shop are probably honeycombed with secret panels and doors which would baffle a magician. Hansen made some answer, but I said nothing. Since our return to Gordon's apartment, I had been conscious of a feeling of intense languor and sluggishness which not even my condition could account for. I knew that my system was full of the elixir, but my mind seemed strangely slow and hard of comprehension, in direct contrast with the average state of my mentality when stimulated by the hellish dope. This condition was slowly leaving me, like mist floating from the surface of a lake, and I felt as if I were waking gradually from a long and unnaturally sound sleep. Gordon was saying, I would give a good deal to know if Kamenos is really one of Cthulhu's slaves, or if the scorpion managed to make his escape through some natural exit as we entered. Kamenos is his servant, true enough, I found myself saying slowly, as if searching for the proper words. As we left, I saw his gaze light upon the scorpion which is traced on my hand. His eyes narrowed, and as we were leaving he contrived to brush close against me and to whisper in a quick, low voice, Soho, 48. Gordon came erect like a loosened steel bow. Indeed, he rapped. Why did you not tell me at the time? I don't know. My friend eyed me sharply. I noticed you seemed like a man intoxicated all the way from the shop, said he. I attributed this to some aftermath of hashish. But no, Cthulhu's is undoubtedly a masterful disciple of Mesmer. His powers over venomous reptiles shows that, and I am beginning to believe it is the real source of his power over humans. Somehow, the master caught you off your guard in that shop and partly asserted his dominance over your mind. From what hidden nook he sent his thought waves to shatter your brain, I do not know, but Cthulhu's was somewhere in that shop, I am sure. He was. He was in the mummy case. The mummy case? Gordon exclaimed, rather impatiently. That is impossible. The mummy quite filled it, and not even such a thin being as the master could have found room in there. I shrugged my shoulders, unable to argue the point, but somehow sure of the truth of my statement. Kamenos, Gordon continued, doubtless is not a member of the inner circle and does not know of your change of allegiance. Seeing the mark of the scorpion, he undoubtedly supposed you to be a spy of the master's. The whole thing may be a plot to ensnare us, but I feel that the man was sincere. Soho 48 can be nothing less than the scorpion's new rendezvous. I too felt that Gordon was right, though a suspicion lurked in my mind. I secured the papers of Major Morley yesterday, he continued, and while you slept I went over them. Mostly they but corroborated what I already knew, touched on the arrest of the natives and repeated the theory that one vast genius was behind all. But there was one matter which interested me greatly, and which I think will interest you also. From his strong box, he took a manuscript written in the close, neat characters of the unfortunate major, and in a monotonous, droning voice which betrayed little of his intense excitement, he read the following nightmarish narrative. This matter... I consider worth jotting down. As to whether it has any bearing on the case at hand, further developments will show. At Alexandria, where I spent some weeks seeking further clues as to the identity of the man known as the Scorpion, I made the acquaintance, through my friend Ahmed Shah, of the noted Egyptologist, Professor Ezra Shula, of New York. 
he verified the statement made by various laymen concerning the legend of the Ocean Man. This myth, handed down from generation to generation, stretches back into the very mists of antiquity and is, briefly, that some day a man shall come up out of the sea and shall lead the people of Egypt to victory over all others. This legend has spread over the continent, so that now all black races consider that it deals with the coming of a universal emperor. Professor Schuller gave it as his opinion that the myth was somehow connected with the lost Atlantis, which, he maintains, was located between the African and South American continents, and to whose inhabitants the ancestors of the Egyptians were tributary. The reasons for his connection are too lengthy and vague to note here, but following the line of his theory, he told me a strange and fantastic tale. He said that a close friend of his, von Laufmann of Germany, a sort of freelance scientist, now dead, was sailing off the coast of Senegal some years ago for the purpose of investigating and classifying the rare specimens of sea life found there. He was using for his purpose a small trading vessel manned by a crew of Moors, Greeks, and Negroes. Some days out of sight of land, something floating was sighted, and this object, being grappled and brought aboard, proved to be a mummy case of the most curious kind. Professor Schuller explained to me the features whereby it differed from the ordinary Egyptian style, but from his rather technical account, I merely got the impression that it was a strangely shaped affair, carved with characters neither cuneiform nor hieroglyphic. The case was heavily lacquered, being watertight and airtight, and von Laufmann had considerable difficulty in opening it. However, he managed to do so without damaging the case, and a most unusual mummy was revealed. Schuller said that he never saw either the mummy or the case, but that from descriptions given him by the Greek skipper who was present at the opening of the case, the mummy differed as much from the ordinary man as the case differed from the conventional type. Examination proved that the subject had not undergone the usual procedure of mummification. All parts were intact just as in life, but the whole form was shrunk and hardened to a wood-like consistency. Cloth wrappings swathed the thing, and they crumbled to dust and vanished the instant air was let in upon them. Von Laufmann was impressed by the effect upon the crew. The Greeks showed no interest beyond that which would ordinarily be shown by any man, but the Moors, and even more the Negroes, seemed to be rendered temporarily insane. As the case was hoisted on board, they all fell prostrate on the deck and raised a sort of worshipful chant, and it was necessary to use force in order to exclude them from the cabin wherein the mummy was exposed. A number of fights broke out between them, and the Greek element of the crew and the skipper and von Laufmann thought best to put back to the nearest port in all haste. The skipper attributed it to the natural aversion of seamen toward having a corpse on board, but von Laufmann seemed to sense a deeper meaning. They made port in Lagos, and that very night von Laufmann was murdered in his stateroom, and the mummy and its case vanished. All the Moor and Negro sailors deserted ship the same night. Schuller said, and here the matter took on a sinister and mysterious aspect, that immediately afterward this widespread unrest among the natives began to smolder and take tangible form. He connected it in some manner with the old legend. An aura of mystery, also, hung over von Laufmann's death. He had taken the mummy into his stateroom, and anticipating an attack from the fanatical crew, 
had carefully barred and bolted door and portholes. The skipper, a reliable man, swore that it was virtually impossible to effect an entrance from without, and what signs were present pointed to the fact that the locks had been worked from within. The scientist was killed by a dagger which formed part of his collection and which was left in his breast. As I have said, immediately afterward, the African cauldron began to seethe. Schuler said that in his opinion, the natives considered the ancient prophecy fulfilled. The mummy was the man from the sea. Schuler gave his opinion that the thing was the work of Atlanteans and that the man in the mummy case was a native of lost Atlantis. How the case came to float up through the fathoms of water which cover the forgotten land, he does not venture to offer a theory. He is sure that somewhere in the ghost-ridden mazes of the African jungles, the mummy has been enthroned as a god, and inspired by the dead thing, the black warriors are gathering for a wholesale massacre. He believes also that some crafty Muslim is the direct moving power of the threatened rebellion. Gordon ceased and looked up at me. Mummies seem to weave a weird dance through the warp of this tale, he said. The German scientist took several pictures of the mummy with his camera, and it was after seeing these, which, strangely enough, were not stolen along with the thing, that Major Morley began to think himself on the brink of some monstrous discovery. His diary reflects his state of mind and becomes incoherent. His condition seems to have bordered on insanity. What did he learn to unbalance him so? Do you suppose that the mesmeric spells of Cthulhus were used against him? These pictures, I began, they fell into Shula's hands, and he gave one to Morley. I found it among the manuscripts. He handed the thing to me, watching me narrowly. I stared, then rose unsteadily and poured myself a tumbler of wine. Not a dead idol in a voodoo hut, I said shakily, but a monster animated by fearsome life, roaming the world for victims. Morley had seen the master. That is why his brain crumbled. Gordon, as I hope to live again, that is the face of Cthulhus. Gordon stared wordlessly at me. The master hand, Gordon, I laughed, a certain grim enjoyment penetrating the mists of my horror at the sight of the steel-nerved Englishman struck speechless, doubtless for the first time in his life. He moistened his lips and said in a scarcely recognizable voice, Then, in God's name, Costigan, nothing is stable or certain, and mankind hovers at the brink of untold abysses of nameless horror. If that dead monster, found by von Lorfman, be in truth the scorpion, brought to life in some hideous fashion, what can mortal effort do against him? The mummy at Kamenos's, I began. I, the man whose flesh, hardened by a thousand years of non-existence, that must have been Cthulhus himself. He would have just had time to strip, wrap himself in the linens, and step into the case before we entered. You remember that the case, leaning upright against the wall, stood partly concealed by a large Burmese idol, which obstructed our view, and doubtless gave him time to accomplish his purpose. My God! Costigan, with what horror of the prehistoric world are we dealing? I have heard of Hindu fakirs who could induce a condition closely resembling death. I began, Is it not possible that Cthulhus, a shrewd and crafty Oriental, could have placed himself in this state, and his followers have placed the case in the ocean where it was sure to be found? And might not he have been in this shape tonight at Kamenas's? Gordon shook his head. No, I have seen these fakirs. None of them ever feigned death to the extent of becoming shriveled and hard, in a word, dried up. Morley, narrating in another place 
the description of the mummy case, as jotted down by von Laufmann and passed on to Schuller, mentions the fact that the large proportions of seaweed adhered to it, seaweed of a kind found only at great depths on the bottom of the ocean. The wood, too, was a kind which von Laufmann failed to recognize or to classify, in spite of the fact that he was one of the greatest living authorities on flora. And his notes again and again emphasize the enormous age of the thing. He admitted that there was no way of telling how old the mummy was, but his hints intimate that he believed it to be not thousands of years old, but millions of years old. No, we must face the facts, since you are positive that the picture of the mummy is the picture of Cthulhus, and there is little room for fraud. One of two things is practically certain. The scorpion was never dead, but ages ago was placed in that mummy case and his life preserved in some manner, or else he was dead and has been brought to life. Either of these theories, viewed in the cold light of reason, is absolutely untenable. Are we all insane? Had you ever walked the road to Hashish land, I said somberly, you could believe anything to be true. Had you ever gazed into the terrible reptilian eyes of Cthulhas, the sorcerer, you would not doubt that he was both dead and alive. Gordon gazed out the window, his fine face haggard in the grey light which had begun to steal through them. At any rate, said he, there are two places which I intend exploring thoroughly before the sun rises again. Kamenos's antique shop and Soho 48.